Could losing a few pounds uh, keep folks to war keep them from uh, first of all, warding off COVID? As the second leading cause of preventable death in the United States, obesity increases the risk of developing severe symptoms or dying from the virus, according to a new study. A 2020, a 2020 study published by the Critical Journal of World Obesity found that those with obesity have a 46% increased chance of getting COVID, a 113% increase in being hospitalized, a 74% chance of being treated in the ICU, and a 48% increase in death from COVID. In 2018, the CDC reported 42 2% of Americans were classified as obese. Now, 2020 self-reporting obesity map shows the highest rates of obesity are in the South and the Midwest. In the United States, more than 60 million reported cases of COVID and more than 836,000 people have passed away as a result. Joining us now is Dr. Joseph Graves, Jr., Professor of Biological Sciences at North Carolina A&T University. Doc, glad to have you back on the show. Um, when we talk about comorbidities, this is what, what are the issues here? Uh, that we often heard from the beginning uh, of how COVID uh, attacks folks. And so in what way uh, does losing weight keep you from being able to possibly warding off COVID? Well, the important thing to understand is that being overweight impacts the immune system and it causes you to be in a constant state of inflammation. Uh, inflammation actually is one of the ways that the body fights off viruses but the problem is there's a cost for inflammation. And so the more inflamed you are, the more tissue damage occurs. Now, when you get an infectious agent like COVID or any other virus for that matter, um, if you're in that state of constant inflammation, while you're fighting the virus, you're also doing more tissue damage. So it becomes a vicious cycle. So the bottom line is for a number of health-related outcomes, you're better off losing weight uh, across the board. Now, of course, there have been people who are not overweight who died from COVID. So we're talking about relative risk. Mm -hmm. So a person who is does not fall into the category of being overweight has less risk of having a severe, of one, of contracting COVID and of having a severe case of it, which requires you to go to the ICU um, and so we don't want to be that person. Uh, you can list all of the benefits that come from being um, essentially under uh, the obesity profile. Um, and if you do that, there are just so many things to gain from basically being healthy, um, you know, less risk of hypertension, less risk of diabetes, less risk of overall metabolic syndromes stronger immune system, um, you know, I, it's really uh, one of these no-brainers to make an argument for people getting in shape. And, and this is really isn't that difficult to do. Um, it doesn't require a whole lot of vigorous exercise, but it requires consistent exercise. It requires watching what you eat. And then the, I mean, the biggest issue for most people is that we've created a society where food is marketed to them that leads them to obesity. And that's why beginning in the 1950s, we began, you know, worldwide, you know, obesity epidemic. Now, where we are now, we, we are seeing um, uh, Omicron uh, spread uh, rapidly. We're seeing, I mean, just, uh, just case after case after case. And one of the things that uh, has really jumped out, you now have medical experts saying, hey, we're just simply going to have to get used to living with COVID. Um, when you hear that, what does that mean? Because, again, that was a thought that, okay, how do we get beyond COVID? So are they suggesting that from this point forward, forward COVID is always going to be with us? It's now highly likely that COVID is always going to be with us. And, and again, you remember our conversations now two years ago. When I pointed out, if we didn't have a, a concerted national plan, if we didn't act um, judiciously to get people vaccinated across the country, if we didn't move to get people vaccinated across the world, that we would begin to get more and more dangerous variants. And that's exactly what's happened. And so now we're in a situation where, um, with Joe Biden becoming the president of the United States, he attempted to enact a national plan to control COVID. The problem was, however, that the Republicans 
decided that they wanted to torpedo a national plan. Uh, and they're doing so because they think that by making the situation worse, that people are going to turn out in the 2022 elections and vote against them. And, and they may be right about that. Um, so we have a situation where people's lives, once again, are being you know, placed in danger because some people refuse to act in the nation's good and are simply acting for their own narrow interests. So with, with, with that being the case, um, what does that mean, that we are forever going to be wearing masks, having to use hand sanitizer, having a social distance? Unfortunately, unless we turn around, unless we decide to act in the interests of the human species and not in the interests of those who want to retain power in Washington, that's exactly what may happen. And you also know that I have um, cautioned folks on this show that even though COVID is bad, it's not as bad as some of the other viruses which are on the horizon. And so if we can't solve the problem of COVID, what exactly can we expect will happen to this nation and the world when a more dangerous virus goes pandemic? My argument would be we could be looking at hundreds of millions of people dead like we did in the 1919 H1N1 influenza pandemic. And so we really need to be taking how we address what we do with COVID as a cautionary lesson for how bad things can get. And unfortunately, once again, we have a whole bunch of people in Washington who, who made it very clear that they really don't care about the lives of the American people and that all they care about is lining their own pockets. Questions from uh, the panel. Jeff, I'll start with you. All right. First off, uh, thanks, Dr. Graves, for all the work that you're doing. Thank you for everything that you're putting into the world. Uh, and thank you for being on the front line, not only of research, but of implementation to try to save people, starting with our people and moving toward, uh, toward humanity. We know we're living in a space where something like an infectious disease has been politicized, uh, and yet we still have to be able to look out for each other. Weight loss goes across all spaces when you talk about health. Uh, whether that's blood pressure, diabetes, hypertension, uh, any number of things. What can we say in a general way to get uh, Uncle Ricky and Grandmama and Cousin Jeannie, what do we say to them to say, listen, this is the time to get off the couch and do something that's going to help save your life? Well, I think one of the problems that we have is viewing the causes of obesity as simply, you know, inadequacies of individuals. And if you think the issue is, oh, just convince Uncle Ricky to get off the couch, mm -hmm. then we're never going to solve the obesity epidemic. The problem is systematic. For example, in the 1950s, um, food companies began to add sweeteners to virtually every product we eat in the form of things like high fructose corn syrup. And they created uh, a market and they created um, a society that was essentially addicted to these high sweetened foods. And they became part of American culture. And, you know, as Malcolm X said, you know, he was never surprised when chickens came home, come home to roost. And that's exactly what we have in the obesity epidemic. We have a systematic change in the way the nation eats. Uh, in the foods that are made available to them, in the pricing of foods, where it's actually cheaper to eat, you know, high carbohydrate, high sweet level foods than it is to get healthy foods. And, and again, these things were differentially propagated in black and brown communities. And so now we have an obesity epidemic, and then you add to that an infectious agent like COVID. And once again, we have a perfect storm that's destroying people's lives. So again, we want to convince our, our, our loved ones that they should do something to improve their diet. In fact, my, my doctor told me the same thing um, over the Christmas vacation, that I had to take more time to exercise that I needed to change my diet. And, and I've been doing so. But the simple fact of the matter is it's much deeper than that. When you turn on the television at 8 o'clock at night to watch the football game, and then there's Pizza Hut, and then there's McDonald's, and on and on and on. 
And so that's a problem we have. It's not simply an individual solution. It's a systemic solution. Julian. Doc, I'm so glad that you made that point about the systemic solution. And uh, brother, um, my brother, I, I'm glad that you raised the question about getting somebody off the couch because it is systemic and it's really about predatory capitalists extracting, extracting surplus value from people. As you say, when you turn on the television and you're barraged with candy commercials, pizza commercials, you know, and some of that food looks good, but you know it's not good for you. But it's not just about an individual and their diet. It's about the individual who lives in a predatory capitalist structure that is designed to exploit them. Among the most exploited, which I'm very concerned about, are African-American women. According to some statistics, four in five of us are either overweight or obese. Another statistic says 56 percent of us have a body mass index of over 30. We know that African-American women carry the burden of our people on our backs. And we know that many, because of depression, overwork, whatever, are self-medicating. Do you have, and that self-medication comes with food. I have a colleague one day, I said to her, what are you doing? She said, eating. I said, what are you eating? She said, a cheesecake. I said, surely you mean a slice of cheesecake. She said, no, I'm going to eat the whole, I'm going to eat the whole thing. I'm like, all right, uh, no comment. But what can we say to black women specifically uh, about this? Because not only are we killing ourselves through what we eat, but we're also modeling certain kind of behavior for our children and especially for our daughters. Dr. Malvo, I'm again, I'm really happy that you made that point because again, this goes to the systematic oppression of black and brown people in the United States. We know full well that the brain is wired um, to respond to oppression in bad ways. One of the, those ways is to seek immediate pleasure and food is one of the most addictive forms of pleasure, in, in many ways more addictive than heroin. And so therefore, when you make this high um, fat, high sugar, um, high carbohydrate, dense foods available to people on a regular basis, and at the same time, you drive them into despair by the social conditions of cultural conditions that they're forced to face every day, once again, the result is, is not surprising. In other words, this is a computer algorithm that provides an answer and it really can't provide another answer. So the question of, you know, how do we respond to that? We have to be aware of the things you just pointed out. If we let them kill us, they win. And so therefore, we have to take the initiative to do a better job of modeling appropriate behaviors to deal with stress, to deal with depression. Uh, this has to be a community effort. We have to do it at our workplaces. We have to do it in our churches. We have to do it in our universities. And there is definitely a role for the historically black institutions who are leading the way in much of the biomedical research associated with health disparity to come to the forefront on this, uh, on this issue. Um, Amakongo. Well, first of all, um, Dr. Grace, I really, really want to commend you for your work. I, re I remember that show when you talked about new variants that could be on the way and how we wouldn't be able to deal with something that was worse than COVID. I remember that from years ago, and I, I've, it's been seared in my head. And I can't think of anything that you've said about this pandemic that has not turned out to be true. So I just, I just appreciate your continual service to everybody on this. Uh, the, the, the question that I have... It's kind of on the flip side of the diet issue, right? I'm seeing that in our efforts in this country and beyond to do things like not have uh, fat shaming and, and, all, and body shaming, which is extremely important, and we understand how that has been problematic, particularly how the way people have viewed you know, black women's bodies compared to white women's bodies, and, and we understand that. But part of me feels like, as a society, because we've been on the side of promoting kind of everybody being comfortable in their own body, we haven't really talked about the importance of healthy lifestyles and whether we're talking about someone who's severely overweight or somebody who's severely thin, right? It's kind of just a everybody kind of do you mentality, which I feel kind of promotes more negative health styles. So what are your thoughts as it relates to that? Yeah, I mean, again, this is a question of, of us 
taking responsibility for how we organize our fight back. And we are, as I pointed out in, in the last um, response, we are fighting against something that's deeply um, evolutionarily wired into our brains. Food is something that makes people feel better, particularly oil, high oil content, high sugar content, high fat content foods make people feel better. And so we've got to find better ways of making ourselves feel better. One of those ways is to take on, as Dr. Malvo, you know, racial capitalism. If we dismantle this system, then we're going to make ourselves healthier. It's one of the arguments, by the way, and again, you know, I was listening to the last segment of the show that was discussing voting rights and how this attack on voting rights was impacting more than black and brown people. It's impacting everyone. So the same things we're talking about are happening to the white community. There's an excellent book by a scholar by the name of John Metzl called Dying of Whiteness, in which he points out that racial resentment against the very programs that would help the vast majority of white people in this country are getting them to turn against the kind of health-related programs that would make them healthier and at the same time make all of us healthier. What's the name of that book? uh, the, t- the title of the book is Dying of Whiteness. Got it. And so that's what we need to do. We, we need to unite around issues that are beneficial to all of us. And one of these things is, the f- is fighting the obesity epidemic. And that means we have to hold accountable these corporations which are marketing foods which make people sick. And that's exactly what they're doing. And they're doing it to make a dollar. All right. Dr. Graves, we certainly appreciate it. Thank you so very much for joining us. Thank you, Ron. Back to our Mark Unfiltered video in just one moment. to be smart. Roland Martin's doing this every day. Oh, no punches! Thank you, Roland Martin, for always giving voice to the issues. Look for Roland Martin in the whirlwind, to quote Marcus Garvey again. The video looks phenomenal, so I'm really excited to see it on my big screen. We support this man, Black Media. He makes sure that our stories are told. See, this is the difference between Black Star Network and Black-owned media and something like CNN. I got to defer to the brilliance of Dr. Carr and to the brilliance of the Black Star Network. I am rolling with rolling all the way. Honored to be on a show that you own. A Black man <laughs> owns the show. Folks, Black Star Network is here. I'm real uh, revolutionary right now. Wow. Rolling was amazing on that. Stay black. I love y'all. I can't commend you enough about this platform that you've created for us to be able to share who we are, what we're doing in the world, and the impact that we're having. Let's be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You can't be black on media and be scared. You dig?